In this lesson, I'll show you how to sketch the graphs of polynomial functions. The steps of doing this are outlined right here, and we'll be referring to them as we do the question, which reads, sketch the graph of the function 2x to the power of 5, so it's a fifth degree polynomial, and the rest of the expression is shown. Now keep in mind that the question is asking for a sketch. Therefore, it doesn't have to be completely accurate. All we're looking for is the correct shape of the graph. Step number one says, determine the end behavior. To do this, as shown in one of our previous videos, you take a look at the first term of the polynomial, specifically 2x to the power of 5. That's the highest degree. And if this value, which we'll call a, is greater than 0, which it is, then the end behavior, so as x gets larger and larger, expect the graph to go up. It only goes up as its end behavior if the a term is greater than 0, which it is. Now what about the start of the polynomial? The exponent here, given that 5 is odd, this means that the graph will be starting below the x-axis, making its way up. So it starts below the x-axis, that's how it will look like. So if this is our xy plane, expect something like this. Let me just erase that for now. Moving on to step number two, plot the y-intercept where the function is set to x is equal to 0. So I'll set x equal to 0, and what I will find is that f at 0 is 12 in this particular case. So let me start to plot, or let me start to sketch what this is starting to look like. This is our y-axis, this is our x-axis, and we have a point definitely at 0 and 12. And we know that it will go this way, and it will start below the x-axis. Step number three says use the rational zero theorem and factor theorem in synthetic division or the intermediate value theorem to find all zeros and completely factor f. However, before we do any of this, let's use Descartes' rule of signs to tell us how many positive real zeros there are and how many negative real zeros there are. And that is determined based on the number of sign changes from term to term. So this is positive to negative, that's one sign change. No change there. Another change there, so that's two, three, and four. So there are four real positive roots. Or there could be two real positive roots or zero real positive roots. Now the explanation for this has been covered in our previous videos, but essentially whenever you find out the number four, for example, or any number, let's say three or two, well, we subtract by a factor of two to tell you the possibilities. So this is what you should expect. Another part of Descartes' rule of signs is that if we substitute negative x into our function and we repeat the process, that will tell us how many negative real zeros it could have. So substituting negative x, let's write that down right here. That makes this negative 2x to the power of 5. That makes that negative 5x to the power of 4. This is positive 2x to the power of 3 positive 7x to the power of 2, positive 4x, and plus 12. So taking a look at the sign changes, this goes from negative to negative, so none so far. That's one change, no, no, and no. So there is exactly one real negative root. Now that we learned something about the roots, we can begin the rational zero theorem, and that involves looking at the constant value, which I'll call p, and this value, which I'll call q, the leading coefficient. And we find factors of 12 and 2, and we divide them. So p over q, factors of 12 include plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3, plus minus 4, plus minus 6, and plus minus 12. And factors of q, Two, well, that's a prime number, so it's plus minus one and plus minus two. We have to divide one to both of these, two to both of these, three, four, six, and 12, and so on. And those will give us quotients. It will give us answers to those division statements. Starting with the ones, we get plus minus one, and one divided by two is plus minus a half. Next comes the two, 
plus minus 2 over plus minus 1 is plus minus 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. We already wrote that down. And we go through each of the numbers at the top with those two at the bottom. And you should end up with these. Now we have some potential candidates of roots that we can use to create a factored form version of our function if we need to. What you're supposed to do now is take each of these and try them out into our function. If any one of them gives an output of 0, then it is a root. And as you can tell, that would take a long time. There's so many of them. Now, I've already done it for you, and I found out that if you put plus 2 into the function, you will end up with 0. And that's an indication that 2 is a root. So let me write that down. We'll have a root at 2 and 0, so somewhere right there. I know that my graph will be going up from below the x-axis and then eventually making its way up to the right of the x-axis. This also accounts as one of the real positive roots. There could be four, there could be two, there could be none. Obviously, there is one, so we can discount that. And let's see what else we can find out. If you substitute f at negative two, you will end up with negative 80. And we can start to use this with the theorem explained here known as the intermediate value theorem. So if f at negative 2 is negative 80, and f at 0 happened to be 12 from earlier, given that these are opposite signs, there exists a root between 0 and negative 2. And as mentioned, there is one real negative root, so this will help us find it. f at negative 1 happens to be 18, so we can start to narrow it down. It will be between negative 1 and negative 2 along here, negative 1 and negative 2. So let's say that that right there is negative 1 and negative 2. There should be a root in between. Interestingly, if you plug in negative 0 0.5 into the function, you will end up with an output of 0. And remember, negative 0 0.5 was one of the quotients we found earlier. So let me show that on the graph. I'll put a line randomly between these two. And f at negative 1 happened to be 18. So it should go up. And then eventually, it will cross the y-axis. And we'll have a point right here as well. Let's say that it is negative 2 and 80. That's one of the negative real roots that we discussed. This would be negative 1 and 18. And our sketch is coming along just fine. If I were to substitute f at 1 into my function, I end up with 10. So f at 1 is 10. That's below 12. So expect something right here. So it should look like this. It's starting to bend. And it will eventually reach the point 2 and 0. To determine what happens after 2 and 0, you can choose test values that are greater than x is equal to 2 to see what will be outputted. It turns out that any value you choose bigger than 2 will give a positive output for this function. This means the graph will never cross the x-axis. Remember something interesting from a past video. Only an even multiplicity will produce a graph with this type of behavior. Therefore, it's consistent with what we learned earlier from Descartes' rule of signs that said it's either two real roots or four. So we would expect this sort of thing to happen where the graph doesn't cross the x-axis, even without test values. So what you see right here is the sketch that represents our polynomial. And there you have it. That is how to sketch the graphs of a polynomial function.